Hello, I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. Well, for fall 2022, there was a national shortage of teachers for K through 12. And certainly the pandemic is a major contributor to this shortage, but for several years, there have been a continual decline in the entering of the teaching profession. With joining me in a conversation to explore the causes, effects, and possible solutions to our national shortage of teachers is Dr. Kristen Gessman, Director of the School of Education at Virginia Tech. And friend and colleague, welcome to the show. It's good to see you. It's wonderful to see you. Thank you for this invitation. I should have said former colleague, now that I'm retired, but I still consider you as a colleague. Well, this is a, a, a very important um, issue and topic, somewhat caught by surprise. I guess, is it safe to say that there appears to be teacher shortages in the fall of 2022, but it wasn't isolated necessarily in terms of north, south, or geographic region, maybe more urban than some of the rules, but was this a really a national phenomenon per se? Well, this is a national phenomenon, but it's actually one that's decades long. And I think the pandemic just highlighted a lot of issues within the labor market for teachers. And so we'll talk a little bit about those today. Uh, before we do, however, you mentioned that we were former colleagues, but indeed, uh, we are still colleagues and friends. And between us, we have 75 years as educators and educational administrators. I shouldn't have maybe said that on television. <laughs> no, that's fine. But it's a good opportunity uh, for both of us to reflect on what drew us from other career opportunities to the field of education. And so I wonder if you might just say a word about that before we talk about the statistics. <laughs> well, well, uh, I love to share. And like many people, and this may be generational, and I'll keep this short, but, uh, you know, family, teachers, faith. Mm -hmm. created so much in terms of who I am, what I am. I can name the teachers. Uh, I can remember them all throughout from elementary school, certainly in terms of through the doctorate and what have you. And so for me, I left the business world and came back to higher ed or mm -hmm. academics to teach because I love teaching and sharing. And to me, that was a, a great joy. Well, I want us to hold on to that personal story because it's important as we think about recruiting people to the field of education and understanding the motivation people have to serve the common good. And so I hope we'll come back to this throughout your questions and my answers. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Well, it does hear a lot about the mass resignations, uh, especially in terms of profession post-COVID. Mm -hmm. um, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, 300,000 teachers quit their jobs between February of 2020 mm -hmm. to May of 2022. Um, according to American Federation of Teachers Survey, 40% said they might look for a job in the next two years. So it certainly seems that COVID, that there was a, a defining moment where teachers decided enough. Well, I don't know if it was a single moment. We actually have decades of trend data that, that look at the teacher shortage uh, across the country. And so the most comprehensive study was actually done in 2016. And this study looked at all available data and tried to make sense out of what was considered an impending crisis in, in, uh, in the labor market for education. And at that time, the data were suggesting that the recession of 2008, the Great Recession, was a significant turning point in, in labor markets. And so one of the things that, that happened is a lot of teachers were laid off during that time period. There were uh, a constellation of sort of push-pull factors uh, in that environment, including uh, layoffs because schools and districts couldn't afford the same number of teachers. Class sizes ballooned when that happened because of course there were fewer teachers and actually the, the population of students across the country on the aggregate was increasing by about three million students per year. Programs uh, shut down or constrained during that time period because the funding just wasn't there. When stimulus funds started to enter uh, the marketplace and particularly in education, school districts were trying to rehire teachers. And what they found was the teachers who had left the market 
uh, the field of education, we're not returning. And teachers, as you, you probably know, have knowledge, skills, and dispositions that actually prepare them for a wide variety of fields. And so a good number of them did not return. Simultaneously, uh, there, there was a lot of negative uh, commentary about education and educators. And so historically, teachers have position, been positioned as both targets and agents of change. And so if there are economic woes or social problems, very often teachers are, are the ones who are expected to ameliorate these, these issues or address these issues. And so the, the environment was such that a lot of teachers were not willing to go, go back into the profession. And we also had a very significant decline in people looking at education or entering schools and colleges of education. At the time, it was around a 30% decline. Today, that range is somewhere between 30 and 70%, depending on where you are in the country. And so uh, we, we started to see a shortage that was anticipated to grow worse over the, the next decade with about three, th sorry, three million students being added to the public school population every year. And so there really was something of a perfect storm happening long before the pandemic. And you know, also, it's just simply a fact that, uh, to add to the mix, is there's a great concern about schools and public education. Mm -hmm. And certainly recently, uh, the test scores on S SOLs in Virginia, not as bad as some mm -hmm. states, but still down. And we know that uh, in terms of support and, and, and satisfaction with public education, according to um, a Gallup poll of September, it was down to just 42 percent, down from 51 percent in 2019. So mm -hmm. there does seem to be a lack of confidence among general public, which just makes it with the teacher, just puts them in, in the middle. It goes back to what I was saying about teachers very often are, are both the targets of change, they're being blamed for social or, or economic issues in society, and then they're also being uh, targeted in some ways as being the remedy or the agent of change. And so I do think teachers actually do have a considerable influence in our economy and our society, our culture in general. It's one of the things that drew you and me to the field, to the, the profession, the opportunity to give back to our communities and positively affect change in outcomes. Uh, yet, at the, at the same time, the field, when there was a shortage, things started changing, a shortage of teachers. And again, I'm talking pre-pandemic. We'll get, I'll get to the pandemic and the effects uh, of that as well. And so one of the things that started happening nationwide, and including here in Virginia, to deal with the shortage of, of teachers in the education labor market, uh, states started changing the requirements to become a teacher. And in fact, you probably remember in, in 2017, our own Governor McAuliffe decided it was necessary to create emergency credentialing and, and change the expectations for teachers uh, to earn their credentials. So we went in, in Virginia, and, and uh, we've got a table uh, for folks to look at. We moved from requiring teachers to earn a master's degree uh, to become a licensed teacher in Virginia and started to allow that credentialing to happen at the undergraduate level. The uh, credentialing process is important because we know teachers who are, are fully prepared, well prepared in traditional programs stay in the field longer. Those who go through alternative licensure programs are much, much more likely to leave in the early years of their career. Uh, in fact, some estimates are two to four times more likely. And this creates a certain amount of, of churn or turnover in a community which then of course impacts student achievement, student engagement. It makes for more work for the teachers who are staying in the school because of course they're, they're having to deal with the constant turnover of new colleagues and changes in, in both the, the community and also the achievement levels of students. And it becomes a very quick uh, process of, uh, of in some ways undermining the intention of, of these policy shifts. More recently, uh, again, the, the concerns about not having enough teachers uh, have increased exponentially across the country. Some estimates suggest um, we were on, on target for about 100,000 teachers, too few every year to keep up with demand. 
post-pandemic with attrition, uh, we're looking at sometimes, in some cases, three times that estimate. And, and certainly that's been the trend in, in Virginia, which means that, uh, again, well-intentioned policymakers are looking for quick solutions. Uh, and one of those solutions is alternative licensure programs. And uh, you, you had mentioned an interest in talking about uh, some of the career switcher programs. Um, this would be incentives for people who have had a long career in another field to consider becoming a teacher. There are incentives for those who have served in the military to become teachers. And in some states, uh, quite honestly, there, there's such a severe shortage of teachers they're allowing students who have high school diplomas to enter the classroom uh, without credentials at all mm -hmm. to earn their credentials over time. Mm -hmm. now, now, all of this might work in, in some fields where the apprenticeship model is sufficient. Uh, unfortunately, in education, the, the evidence suggests that without uh, the opportunity for ongoing professional learning, excellent induction and mentoring support, not only will these folks leave, they will often uh, ju just create more tumult in, in classrooms and in schools that are constantly grappling with, uh, uh, unfortunately, trying to find what one superintendent recently referred to as warm bodies to stand in front of, of classrooms. And we've seen across the, the country, the National Guard has been called into some schools where there are teacher shortages. Really? <laughs> uh, folks who work in cafeterias are, are being called into classrooms, administrators are teaching classes. Uh, and, and what we know is those students who are most vulnerable, vulnerable excuse me, <clears throat> those who experience uh, economic, um, uh, disproportionate economic difficulties in their families or communities, those who have been minoritized uh, often have the teachers who are least well prepared. So again, it perpetuates a cycle and adds, it, it contributes to the difficulty to one, attract people, but also retain highly uh, qualified, well prepared people in the field. And you know, in the meantime, uh, we saw this in the gubernatorial campaign, um, and certainly now that that um, education itself has become, a, public education has become mm -hmm. a political uh, issue itself. Mm -hmm. It rises certainly in the top 10 most of the time, 83% of the public, according to a Harris poll, parents say it is a mm -hmm. political issue. We also notice that school choice is coming back up there, 60% mm -hmm. increase in homeschooling. Mm -hmm. um, there is a um, charter schools up about 8%. Mm -hmm. um, and so now it's really a very politicized environment. Mm -hmm. And again, it puts the teachers kind of stuck in the middle. Well, it definitely does. And, and I think it's important for us to think about understanding the root cause of some of these problems. Again, very often well-intentioned policymakers are eager to make a difference and make policy recommendations without necessarily thinking through what the potential negative effects could be. And so. Um, one of the things I, I would draw our attention to is why, why are teachers leaving? I, I think very often uh, we, we think we know without actually looking at, at available evidence. And so one of the things we, we've touched on a little bit already, and that is the environment of schooling. And so you're right, our schools have become highly politicized and uh, certainly you've You've seen over recent years with uh, unfortunate acts of violence in our schools, as well as um, challenges around how to handle the pandemic. Um, we've also seen uh, our schools, our, our economy and our public rely on our schools often to feed children and youth, uh, as well as provide childcare so uh, family members can go to work. All of this has centered education as being absolutely essential to the health and well-being of not only our economy, but our, our culture and society in general. When, when teachers have that kind of pressure on them and there is not sufficient administrative support, whether it's in the building with a principal or a superintendent or a school board, they, they feel embattled. There is a certain amount of fatigue and it really gets in the way of, of doing the job they feel most called to do, supporting children and youth. We've also seen an increase in unfunded mandates and constraints concerning the curriculum. 
And so what we know about human motivation is that people like choice and control. They like a certain amount of autonomy. Uh, when, when people outside of education mandate not only what has to be taught and how it has to be taught, there's a certain amount of deprofessionalization that happens. And so this impacts teachers. They, they lack the autonomy they crave uh, to really implement what they know are research-based practices uh, and creative practices in the classroom. I would say the other piece of it uh, that, that we've seen, and again, this bears out in the evidence, there's, there are uh, numerous studies uh, that support this, is the impact of testing and the pressures around accountability. Uh, because our schools are not yet uh, equitably funded, many schools have more resources for teachers and students than others, and so the pressure teachers are feeling around these policies is also impacting their sense of satisfaction in, in the field. Uh, I would say, just like other um, segments of the labor market, attrition is also attributed to things like retirement, and in fact, we have a uh, relatively um, advanced <laughs> teaching force uh, in terms of their, their age and number of years in the field. And so we're seeing uh, retirements are part of that attrition number. And just like other segments of, of the market, uh, concerns about childcare or personal reasons uh, are, are reasonable reasons to leave. Uh, and so these are some of the trends that, that we do see. Um, we do know that teachers don't leave in equal proportion. Uh, and in fact, we know that those with the least amount of uh, preparation are the most likely to leave. And I'd already mentioned beginning teachers. Under-resourced schools, again, the most vulnerable populations are, are typically being taught by those with the least amount of preparation. And that's also where we see the highest rates of, of turnover. The, the teacher um, labor market is actually not different from other labor markets. I think it's getting a lot of attention right now because uh, folks are starting to realize how critical our public schools are, again, to the, the health and vitality of, of our economy. Um, you had mentioned something uh, about geography. Uh, indeed, it's actually teachers in the South that turn over more and those uh, in urban settings uh, when we look nationally. Well, you know, one of the things is that as you look toward the future and we'll shift toward what should be done, yes. we know without question um, recruitment it, there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a pipeline, mm -hmm. and yet the, uh, uh, the uh, one particular uh, survey showed that 74% of teachers claim they would not recommend the profession. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you look long term, how do we build out of this mm -hmm. in terms of the profession of teaching? How do you get the, quote, not that they're not, mm -hmm. but a wider interest among students for the profession mm -hmm. looking to the future? Well, what do you think we should do? I think you can actually contribute to this in a very direct way. <laughs> we, we have, for, uh, fr from the beginning of public education, so going back to the 19th century, had a discourse in this country that, again, positions teachers as being responsible for all social and economic outcomes without providing them the professionalism or the support to actually do the job that they, are, they feel called to do. Uh, and so I think one of the things that we, we want to do is start asking more questions. So uh, I, I had a good friend, a physical education teacher, who used to say, we should know a little less and understand a little more. And so it's not uncommon, Bob, that I, I walk into a room where people are talking about education and they are focusing on solutions without actually asking questions about the underlying problems. And so I, I guess I would ask folks to um, assume a little less <laughs> about their knowledge regarding teaching and learning and public education and, and kind of lean in and ask questions and, and seek to understand the field. Um, we, we have an opportunity at this moment to really figure out how to shift the narrative uh, from one that focuses on deficits to instead assets. 
Uh, let me tell you, it's remarkable, frankly, with the interrupted schooling and public health crises, as well as mental health crises, that we have retained so many outstanding, skilled, committed educators in Virginia and the country. And, and similarly remarkable that our students have fared fairly well. Uh, do I agree that student achievement could increase? And of course, and of course I want that and work towards that. And I think there are reasons why we have had some very flat levels of achievement for decades and some of those reasons we've talked about today. So what's the role of, of parents? I mean, um, the reason it seems like they're voicing more is because losing confidence in the public schools mm -hmm. and it's become so politicized, mm -hmm. but parents are part of the solution and not the, well, it may be part of the problem, but I mean, mm -hmm. should be a team effort. And it seems like right now it's oppositional. Well, and again, I think that that's a choice that we all can make. We can think about uh, what are our aspirations for public education and what would it take to realize that vision of education? And so one of the things I, I point to, un unfortunately I have to, is teacher compensation. And so our voting public really should make sure that our teachers are being compensated at a rate that's equivalent to others who have the same level of education and experience uh, and in their geographic area. And, and that's simply not the case with education. In fact, longitudinal data will show over the past 20 years in more than half of the states in the, in the US, teacher, uh, teacher compensation has not kept pace with just the rate, rate of inflation. And so that's, that's a significant concern. Uh, you might remember back in 2018, before the pandemic, Time Magazine ran a, a story on teacher compensation. And, and the headline, uh, of course, I can't quite find my notes. My, the headline was something along the lines of, I, I'm a 30-year veteran and I sell my blood platelets for supplemental income. Uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 20 to 40% of teachers work second jobs. Um, when we look at uh, teacher education levels and we look at compensation, uh, today the average teacher earns roughly 19% less than their peers, again with similar levels of education uh, and experience in different geographic areas. Back when I was teaching first grade a few decades ago, uh, that difference was just 6%. And so what we're seeing is that again, with, with what has been called the deprofessionalization of our field, there's a larger and larger gap in terms of, of compensation. And some people call this the wage penalty. And uh, sadly, Virginia tops the list of lowest teacher salary when compared to cost of living. So mm. um, there are things that we can do as parents and citizens to advocate to improve our schools. And I would say, until our schools are fully and equitably funded, it's, it's truly unfair to uh, point, point the finger at our educators uh, for somehow not delivering on the promise of, of, uh, of education. So we only have a couple of minutes or so uh, remaining. Mm -hmm. It still seems a big um, fight or disagreements is about content of curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is quite a battle that we see in mm -hmm. uh, fault. Um, and so how does one uh, approach, I mean, we know that two and two supposedly, unless you do your new math, is four. It should teaching content but might be fr considered fringe content mm -hmm. that is problematic. So how can there be curriculum development in a way and what should be the role of parents in that? Well, I think parents are absolutely essential to education. We, we started this segment talking about the influences in your life and, and you named family as, as a critical first teacher, you might say. And I, I could not agree more. National um, organizations put together standards and, and so do states and there's always opportunity for public comment. And so I think 
again, we, we want to make sure that we're thinking about how do we engender involvement in public education and, and when is it important to defer to the experts. So one of the things I would say is that well-prepared teachers are experts in learning sciences. They understand human development, motivation, they know best practices, research-based practices in terms of pedagogy, how to teach content, and which content is appropriate for students at different stages of development. And so it's important, again, to go back to this notion of really investing in, in teacher preparation. You, you probably would not um, question your brain surgeon's credentials, assuming that there is the, the diploma on the wall. And I think too often we are questioning teachers' credentials or, or expertise, and sometimes for good reason. Again, we have very different levels of preparation in our schools because we've had these emergency licensure policies. Uh, and importantly, let me just add, there are many outstanding folks, teachers, and actually folks in higher ed who have gone through alternative licensure programs. So it's not that there aren't individual pockets of excellence. The trend line suggests investing in teachers and their preparation and ongoing learning is really, really critical. And so uh, thinking about your, the neurosurgeon who, who you might see, uh, that person had a four-year bachelor's degree. They went to medical school for another four years and they had a residency that was paid uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of three to seven years. And so I want us to really think carefully about um, how we again position teachers and find ways to focus on what they've been able to do with so few resources and elevate the excellence of our public schools. Well, believe it or not, I mean, we, we barely scratched the surface. It's a very scratched. complex <laughs> a historical issue in terms of teacher shortage. But one thing is for sure mm -hmm. that if we're going to survive as a society, we need teachers mm -hmm. uh, without question. And so this is a, a, a grave concern. Well, that is all the time we have. I want to thank my special guest, Dr. Kristen Gessman, and also who is the director of the School of Education at Virginia Tech. And I want to thank you for joining us and hope you do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.